Hello, I'm Alex Mansfield, the host of Manny Talk Shooting, and welcome to another episode. This is the shooting podcast where I talk to individuals all across the shooting industry. We'll talk competition, self-defense, concealed carry. If you like this content, check out our YouTube channel, Manny Talk Shooting. And without further ado, let's get to this episode. The title sponsor of Manny Talk Shooting is Go Fast Don't Suck. So if you need match banners for your match, check them out. They also have an awesome selection of pre-designed and custom mobile jerseys. Don't forget, they are the home of the dry fire decals for your wall, so get those too. They've also got a plethora of patches and stickers that are hilarious and true. You know, Go Fast Don't Suck has a lot of things that you'll need on the range and off, so please check them out at GoFastDon'tSuck.net. Welcome everybody, welcome back to another installment of Manny Talk Shooting, the shooting podcast on the internet because that's how we live on the internet everyone i mean get off your phones for once and go outside and go do something but um without further ado we got to talk about the man that i made him lose an overall match win i'm (laughs) sitting down with my buddy skylar davis how you doing skylar hey man thanks for having me on no problem it's gonna be a good one and i don't mean to brag or hurt your feelings but that's kind of hilarious i have one good stage and it 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 messes up with the math (laughs) yeah i'll tell you what that was we were sitting at lunch afterward and we're like you know, this could move if somebody else won a stage. And then we all looked at each other like, ah, and then what do you know? Yeah. The open shooter comes out of nowhere and actually has a good stage for the day. Oh, you did good, man. Yeah, it, which is so weird. If anyone actually cares, we're talking about the Brooklyn Sportsman's Club April match. And uh, if you go to the overall, uh, Skyler lost by less than less than a slim point. But then if you go to carry optics, he, he won by a little bit. So that's kind of the... Uh, the the worst part about hit factor math when when somebody else comes in for the day yeah yeah it was a good match though i mean it's a one match point uh either way and it was good to it was good to see the boys and it was kind of a who's who for uh folks who are shooting in michigan so it was awesome yeah that was definitely the most uh heat really for uh carry optics in a long while so with all <laughs> of you together so that was good but uh for skyler for people who don't know you and um who are you and how'd you get into shooting yeah, so uh, competitive shooter, uh, pistol stuff out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, got into shooting, kind of like a lot of folks. Uh, I work in a gym, so we had a little bit of a shutdown in 2020. Uh, you know, I don't know why, but hey, we had a little shutdown in 2020, uh, and I figured, hey, I need to pick up a hobby, something outside. Um, I'd done some country stuff with friends, shooting guns growing up, but never really owned guns. Uh, definitely never actually practiced and whatnot, so... Uh, 2020 got into it some, uh, started shooting, uh, took a bunch of classes, uh, with local guys here, uh, MDFI, uh, they do a great job, but, um, then I, you know, kind of, uh, graduated to the, the competition shooting stuff, um, and, uh, I've been doing it ever since. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So I think a funny fact was, I think John, uh, Chin Chin was actually from the, the West side of the state, but then he moved yeah. over to the East side. So. But uh, I'm surprised you ever ran into him. But that's cool that you're, uh, you know, you did take some comp, uh, not competition, um, you know, defensive style classes from MDFI. If anyone doesn't know, you know, MDFI, the Michigan Defensive Firearms Institute, I want to say, um, ran out of Grand Rapids area, I believe. If I think, I think still, I don't know if they moved their base of headquarters around enough. So yeah, they're all they're all over the place. They do a they do a great job. Those guys did a great job. Uh, you know, kind of teaching the basics. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, everything you need to know to keep the gun running and to shoot it well. And then, uh, you know, it's kind of what's the next step. And uh, I see videos online and all that. And it's, uh, hey, what's this competition thing? And then went out there and got got rocked uh, for a couple, two or three matches. And then said, hey, I want to I want to get better at this. Right. Oh, yeah, 100 percent. So what made you want to start? Besides, you know, taking that next step after taking MDFI classes, what really made you want to jump into this, like, full hearted, like know that this was your thing? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's those first couple of two or three matches, um, going out there and just having fun with the squad, uh, how encouraging people are. Um, you know, obviously your first couple of two or three matches, you're going to get insanely better just because you don't know what you don't know. And, uh, uh kind of knocking some of that, that new guy rust off. Uh, you'll get way better, but just kind of the, the positive influence, the positive feedback you get from if you practice, you get better. If you practice, you get better. And it's it's awesome, that kind of one-to-one relationship. It doesn't come up often in life where there's no real kind of glass ceiling. If you practice hard, if you really attack your weaknesses, if you go out there and compete, like, you will continue to get better uh, for a long, long time. Um, so just getting hooked on the, the, the curve of practice, compete, practice, compete, and 
uh, meeting people along the way that uh, helped to pour more, you know, positive energy into that process. Mm -hmm. Oh, 100 percent. It's uh, <clears throat> it's super cool to be able to go out there and, you know, you go to your matches, you know, you know, most people you tell in their first matches, you know, just have fun today. Don't DQ and just have fun because that's all you they need to worry about. Yep. But it's it's super cool, like you said. There's no real glass ceiling. You can always improve. Um, you know, I, I you know when I first started, I never thought I'd be this good, right? Or I thought I'd be better than this too. You know, there's always that weird ego thing when it comes into it. You know, and then the classification system can't can't humble pretty much most of us. Yeah. But um, yeah. I you mean, I, go ahead. You, you see it on the internet. You're like, hey, yeah, this competition, like, as they're doing that in the movies and stuff, it can't be that hard. And then you go out there and you get rocked by uh <laughs> by folks that have been doing it for a while um and you re you learn that there is a deep deep well mm -hmm. oh there absolutely is you know no one ever wants to get beat by their gyneco you know by a gynecologist or anything or an accountant yeah. but uh yeah. especially the guys who uh are out there use, you know using a firearm every day for their livelihood but uh a lot of people do get their uh their their, their world rocked right and I, I mean i'd listen to you a little bit I mean, we had talked about you coming on the show prior to you getting on Dave's show, The Casual Shooter. So if you guys haven't listened to that, listen to that one, too. Um, they did talk about a lot about powerlifting in the beginning. So, <laughs> yeah, but uh, but that's all good. No. So you, you said, you know, that first one, that couple of those classifiers, that darn one we shot first thing last year in uh, at Brooklyn. That one was like the worst. I did, like I was like, I felt good after my run on that. And I'm like, what? This is like a 45%. This is crap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's for those that are unfamiliar. It's uh, I think it's 99, 13. I hope I'm getting that right. But it's the only class where I know of that you, you have to start with your arms straight overhead. And we were all joking around at the, at the shooters brief in the beginning. Like, you know, you kind of come around with a yardstick, make sure your elbows are straight and all of that, like silly. Uh, and it's three strings and you got to start like that every time. And Man, that uh, that is uh, an absolute wood chipper for uh, new shooters who are not not uh, great with strong hand and weak hand, and also not great at you know draws from from wacky spots. Right, or you're unless you're a rifle shooter and really love that stage because yeah, it it doesn't matter. They get the <laughs> the orangutan start holding a red over their head. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I don't like that stage either, but um, no. So that's pretty cool. God damn. There we go. Now we got that out of the system. It'll make it a little bit easier, hopefully. But um, so we've uh we've come to the point of like so. When you first started shooting, you know, were you shooting like a striker fired pistol at the time? Yeah. So my first gun was uh, a P320. Um, I liked it. I uh, shot it well. Uh, I didn't really know how to practice, so I was just kind of out there turning money into noise. But um, then I heard some of the uh, early reports on you know, recalls and stuff like that. And I uh, didn't want to fiddle with that, especially carrying it every day. So I uh, went into CZ's uh, P07, P09 hammer fired stuff. And now uh, full hipster mode, all DASA all the time. So what made you pick, you know, the, the P09, the P07 when you could have gone to like the P10C? Yeah. Yeah. Um, just carrying appendix at that point, I switched from carrying it, you know, four o'clock, uh, you know, 1911 style uh, out to, you know, carrying appendix and yeah, kind of having the, the, the third safety of being able to thumb that hammer as you holster it uh, can't hurt. Um, when I initially started, you know, shooting, you know, I, you know, I, everybody watches YouTube videos. I did the same thing and it was, uh, you got to learn two different trigger pulls and, as you get better at shooting, it's pretty inconsequential, the two different double action, single action trigger pulls. Uh, so I got over that, that speed bump and I said, Hey, a, a third safety is not necessarily a bad thing. Number one, you know, clear the holster. Number two, keep everything out of the trigger. And then number three, you can thumb that hammer as you can go uh, back into the holster too. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. That is definitely a great safety feature and a good mindset to be in too. Um, yeah, you definitely... <laughs> Especially in appendix, you definitely don't want to have that uh, that oopsie, right? It's that or have a a, a P320 uh, you know blaster cannon just uh, randomly explode on you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At that time, it was like the old P320, like they weren't drop safe kind of thing. Uh, and there were all the videos of people hitting them with hammers and stuff. And I mean, Sig fixed it, but that that was enough to give me cold feet. And uh, I traded for a, a gently loved uh, P07, and then never never really looked back. Right. Fair enough. You know, the PO7 and the PO9 are good guns. Mm -hmm. Definitely um, not. They don't get enough love, it seems like. 
Yeah, it's a it's a weird gun for sure. A lot of the CZ fans are like, hey, you have to go to the all metal guns because that's you know what they're known for and stuff. But man, those guns uh, run. I shot my whole first season of USPSA with the uh, BO9, and uh, other than having a, a magwell that I think is like one millimeter wider than the actual magazine, uh, <laughs> they work really well. Uh, mm-hmm. It's just really hard to reload them fast. Yeah. Well, the, anything's better than the the Phantom. I want to say the CZ Phantom. That thing is trash. Not gonna lie. I don't know that one. Oh yeah, don't worry about it. It's it's trash. <laughs> don't worry about it. But um, so Skyler, you said you work in a gym. Um, what made you go down that career path? Yeah. Uh, so I've always, you know, uh, played sports and whatnot, but I've always been better at working out than I was at at the sports. And uh, you know, just having um, uh, mentors, having coaches that you know really pushed me and stuff growing up. I wanted to, to have that impact on other people. I know. I don't want anyone who you know is willing to do the work, uh, willing to willing to grind and get after it, to not be able to reach our goals. So, you know, kind of developing the tools, developing the coaching skills, and putting those people in a position where they can get better. Um, it's very similar to the to the USBSA, the competitive shooting stuff. Um, it's just kind of taking that glass ceiling off for folks and trying to point them in the right direction. Um, I love it. Uh, work with a great team. It's different every day. Uh, it's people driven. Uh, so I get to you know, meet some of the best people. We train athletes, uh, as well as adults. Uh, so we get people from all different walks of life and, uh, it's awesome. It's extremely fulfilling. Um, and, you know, speaking toward the, the competitive shooting side of stuff, it's at least tangentially related. Um, you know, being able to move well, uh, being able to build practice plans, uh, and then, you know, talking to people, uh, having a good time, um, and kind of managing your way through a match. A lot of that is coaching, coaching yourself, uh, talking through those. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. And I, uh, I think it it does definitely help you be able to you know create your own plan. You know, be able to diagnose a lot of different things when you're able to watch somebody else. So even even it relates to you know your shooting can relate to your physical fitness and and whatnot. Now, do you deal more with athletes, or do you have you know are you more dealing with regular regular people on your day to day? Yeah. So our our business is easily fifty fifty uh, athletes and adults. Uh, I tend to coach the athletes primarily um, just because, uh, you know, that's where my skill set kind of lends itself to. But uh, on a day-to-day basis, my, my role is to coach our coaches as well. Uh, so I have to know kind of both sides of that and be able to speak to both sides there. Um, the training principles are extremely similar. Uh, some of the training menu, you know, we're not sprinting and jumping with the adults and stuff like that. But uh, the principles of how to talk to people, how to push them, how to take care of them, how to motivate them uh, are very similar across those two. Uh, you just got to translate it, kind of wear a different hat. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. You know, got to know your uh, your target audience at that point, right? What what they are, what, but they also need to meet you at the same distance, right? Like, it's hard to coach somebody when they don't really want to be coached. But when you're working with athletes and those people who are really motivated, to actually seek you know physical training, it, it definitely makes it a difference. It's not just that gym um, muscle man what do they call it i don't know. anyway i'm losing my you know what i'm talking about like the yeah. the i don't know the gym the gym yeah, the, the gym rat right yeah. the people those yeah. those people are going to be getting after it one way or the other and i love them for it right it mm-hmm. helps to push the culture forward you know more people are training now than you know in any of the past 20 30 40 years because it's kind of popular it's in vogue but those people honestly don't need our help uh, they're going to be in the gym crying and getting after it either way. Uh, if they want to reach out, we'll definitely help them. But our job is to uh, to be that that uh, that push or that pull that somebody needs to to get back on the wagon or to to get to that next level. Uh, the people that need our help. One hundred percent. Now, do you work in like a CrossFit gym or is this more of like a traditional type gym? Yeah, so uh, it's a more of a traditional type gym, uh, but you wouldn't really recognize it from like a Planet Fitness or like a Globo Gym kind of thing. There's no machines. Uh, you know, we got the weights and stuff, but what we prize the most is space uh, mm-hmm. because we need to be able to move and adjust. And what we do is small group semi-private training. So the whole thing is we have, you know, six clients per coach maximum. So we're adjusting. Everyone's on different programs. Everyone's doing different stuff every day. And that kind of uh, harkens back to what I was talking about. It's different every day. There's the problem-solving side of it. There's the communication side of it. Making those decisions on the fly is awesome. So 
I was talk, you know, you get this question a lot, and the, it's kind of like the mixed martial arts of training, right? Where it's we're going to take the best parts of all the different, you know, we're doing some yoga stuff in a warm up. We are doing some some CrossFit stuff if people want to get better at Olympic lifts. We're doing some sprinting. We're doing some powerlifting stuff, and then we're going to finish with some bodybuilding conditioning stuff. Uh, it really depends on their goals, uh, which group it is, which day we're training. Uh, we're going to try to take the best from all of those fields. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. That's good to hear. It's good to see that, you know, you, you just don't discredit one, one aspect and only go to another. So it's, it's good to see that, you know, works out, you know, and, and that, that is nice. You know, Jim's probably this gym, I'm going to bet is probably in some old warehouse somewhere in the middle of Grand Rapids, but Hey, space is a commodity and you need to flaunt it. Right. Yeah. They are definitely uh warehouses. Uh, they're the nicest warehouses to keep them clean. But yeah, for us, it's it's space and room to move we take all the weights and we jam them all to the outsides and it's uh we're coaching right um versus kind of the the classic health club health club is all of the weights and everything are in the center uh and then you know nobody's looking at you nobody's really coaching you and stuff we do the opposite mm -hmm. very good very good now um now if, without you don't have to mention any names but it what is the the most, um, you know, you, you said you deal with athletes. Now, what's mm -hmm. the far, what's the most exotic sport athlete you've had to train? You know, yeah, uh, uh, there's a litany of them. Uh, so we got uh, equestrian homies. We got uh, skiing, uh, but like water skiing, uh, where they do like the slalom thing on one ski, uh, okay. and they're like horizontal, you know, parallel to the water, and they got to brace super hard and whatnot. Uh, uh, I haven't actually coached anyone in. Uh, shooting sports yet, uh, but uh, really exotic from you know the team sports perspective. Uh, everything you can imagine, we've coached it, uh, and you know the biggest part of that process is just talking with the person. What's important to you? What do you need to do better uh, to execute your sport? How can I help you? You know, sharpen your tools to to go out there and compete. And a lot of times, it's how can I you know help you get better to be able to practice more, uh, which is I kind of think how that training stuff involves uh, or integrates with competitive shooting is. You know, of course, raising the ceiling, but we also want to bring the floor up too. How can you fit more training into your yearly cycle? Um, and that's, you know, a big goal for us to make people more resilient. So, um, yeah, a little bit of every sport you could ever imagine, uh, water polo, equestrian, all of that. Um, and uh, it's awesome because I get to learn from those people, uh, talk to them about what's important to them and what they love about the sport and uh, learn some of the, the jargon. Some of the jargon cracks me up. Uh, uh, the hockey and the baseball jargon is uh, far and away the best, but uh, every sport's got their own uh, kind of language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I wouldn't think that you'd you'd have like equestrian people in, but I guess that kind of makes sense, right? Got to you know, got to strengthen the core, got to strengthen the legs. You know, be riding all day, so I guess that does make sense. Yeah, and uh, the amount of disciplines in something like equestrian will make your head spin. There's like six, seven, eight disciplines. There's a couple different you know kind of governing bodies and. The good news is uh, they they all require relatively the same stuff. You got to have strong hips and core. Mm -hmm. Well, that's cool. And thanks for diving into that kind of you know your work style because that you know that kind of intrigues me a little bit. On you know, not everyone is uh, able to have a nine to five, but you have a kind of a cool nine to five, so you can get to. So now, how much do you actually get to work out while you're at work? Yeah, so we uh, generally train in the middle of the day. A lot of our you know, clients are going to come in the morning before work or they're going to come in the evening after work, after school. So we have a, a time block in the middle of the day where we can train one-on-one -on -one clients, meet, work on projects and whatnot, and then train ourselves. Um, but this is one of those, uh, like people think that like, you know, chefs are cooking for themselves every night. People think that, you know, uh, firearms instructors are out at the range every day. You know, it's one of those where, we're at the gym every day for sure, but our training would be uh, extremely, extremely simple um, compared to what a lot of people think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, most of the time it's it's 30, 40 minutes, get it in when you can, and then we're going to do it, you know, maybe three or four days a week. Um, but it's not the elaborate, like, hey, we got three hours workout, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and it's definitely not, you know, before or after work because we're there for a long time. We don't want to, you know, extend that by, uh, you know, our training as well. So, uh, get in when you can absolutely walk the talk, but, uh, we're not <laughs> going through marathon, marathon sessions. Like some people think, right? Yeah. You just, well, and you, your muscles got to have time to relax too. You know, you gotta have a break. You gotta have a break day. You gotta, you know, your muscles can't take a hundred percent abuse all the time. Right. Or you're, you just won't be able to grow those muscles. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you have to recover. Uh, you don't grow in the gym. 
Mm-hmm. Right. Now, so, you know, as you know, you probably know, or you probably preach, hydration is probably a big key mm-hmm. with, uh, you know, active working out. How much, do, do you get enough water a day that you're supposed to? Uh, yeah, so that's tough because, you know, we're obviously talking, we're moving around, we're getting after it. Uh, so during the groups, uh, no, uh, we work on basically an hour schedule. I'm not going to, uh, stop coaching people to chug a bunch of water. Uh, but throughout the day, yeah, probably, uh, try not to drink a bunch of it, you know, super late at night cause you're going to be up using the bathroom and stuff, but, uh, definitely slamming water, uh, during those off times. And then, uh, none of our four locations have air conditioning. Um, it's kind of a, a cultural thing for us, but also air conditioning, a giant warehouse is expensive. So, uh, especially as we go into the summer, we got to stay on top of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You don't, you don't want to be air conditioned in that. And yeah, you got to maintain your body fluids. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you, you come in, so I'll, I'll dive back into our sport. So a little bit, but I'll, I'm going to transition with this. So what, so what are things or activities or workouts that your average competitive shooter can do to be better for the sport? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I think number one is resiliency. So, uh, developing a little bit of mobility and being resilient to, uh, you know, the 10, 12, 15,000 steps that you're going to take in a given match. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the matches, especially midsummer, especially multiple matches in a row, it becomes kind of a grind and uh, it sucks. Your performance is going to dip, but I think most importantly, your enjoyment is going to dip. We've all been there at a super long match, just fried feet hurt, back hurts, you're dehydrated, all of that. So, you know, if there's anything that I could snap my fingers and give to people to have, you know, the biggest impact, it would be just the resiliency to all of those steps, the resiliency to heat. So that's going to come from just, you know, your zone two base cardio type stuff, uh, which is not sexy at all, but it is the engine that does raise the floor a punch. Um, and then this question comes up, you know, quite a bit and people that I, I train with that I practice, you know, shooting with, you know, what are the exercises to really raise the ceiling and whatnot? And, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, one of the best ones I can point to is, you know, sprinting and stopping. Uh, our sport is a bunch of short sprints interrupted by just pounding on the brakes. Uh, how soon can you stop and establish a great shooting platform or a, a good enough shooting platform? And then how soon can you reaccelerate? Um, most of your time in a stage is not going to be shooting. It's going to be moving in between shooting and moving while you shoot. Uh, I think it's Tom talks about, you know, getting to the last target. Um, the whole thing is how quickly can you do that? Now, uh, are you going to be able to sprint flat out? It depends on the range surface. You know, you go down the Cardinal and they got the lava rocks, you go over to, you know, some ranges and they got the sand, you know, that's kind of up to you and the situation dictates, but, uh, having a higher ceiling as far as your ability to sprint, stop on a dime and shoot right away is, uh, is the one thing that I would point to, um, would help almost everyone. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I would definitely agree. And yes, knowing your range surface is very important. What you can and can't get away with on the range, not even from like a rules perspective, but yes, on a you know the. Uh, have you been down to Kentucky to the bluegrass? No, okay, so it's kind of like the same rocks at Cardinal, but some of their bays are sloped. So uh, the rocking pat. So if you think about it, there's different pits, um, but the kind of like so you know how Brooklyn's got them all laid out, you know, back to back. So there's a spot at Kentucky where there's about five bays that are all cuddled together in this pit. But some of the bays, the back of the, you know, the, the ground at the back berm is taller than where you would come out to the walk path. So if you're doing a retreating stage, most people will biff it falling down up range. Yeah. And there's definitely that I had plenty of experience of our rowing a lot of people last year at Kentucky with that problem. I'm like, oh. No, thank you. Yeah, yeah. When a fall turns into a slide, that's uh, it's a little more dangerous. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, you know, you, you know, yes, just falling, hurting yourself, you know, drop, you know, being unsafe and or just actually damaging yourself too. Like, yeah, I bet you know a lot of high, you know, high performance athletes have done some stupid things and hurt themselves for a long period of time with one bad move. Yeah, isn't that uh, isn't that lovely though? Uh, that we're just such connoisseurs of you know dirt pits and gravel and stuff in our sport uh an absolute superpower and be like yeah hey, that's some that's some good gravel that's a good pit <laughs> <laughs> right yeah exactly well hey they build them where they can and i guess it's out of rock and clay and say oh you, yeah. 
you know, you might complain about I, I will you and I will probably complain about South Kent's ground surface forever, but it's nowhere as bad as Houghton Lakes um sportsman clubs. It is literally legitimate like sand they dug up from the beach. Yeah. And it's just like it's going home with you no matter what. It, it's like Hey, I mean, at least if it's sand it drains quickly. You know, it's it's one of those where uh, there's pros and cons to all the surfaces. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely uh, I I don't know. Definitely places like Brooklyn or, you know, where we were at today, Oak Hill have good I would I'll take that every day, but that's not a normal occurrence. Yeah. I like looking at uh you go overseas, uh, especially like the Philippines and stuff where they have uh the crazy like turf surfaces and it looks like perfectly manicured and everything that uh, I don't know what the con is to that, but there's a lot of pros. Yeah, maybe getting a little bit of rubber pellets in your shoe from the, the yeah. turf. Been there. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Like, I remember back in high school when I was, um, our football team had gone to state, so we got to perform as a marching band on, like, Ford Field. Mm-hmm. And that stuff was all, like, no one's like, what is this? It's like, yeah, it's all this crap from the turf. It's like, you'll you'll live with it. <laughs> yeah, it's ground up tires. Uh, have fun finding that in all your shoes for the next week. <laughs> yep, exactly. But hey, nothing wrong with, you know, reuse, you know, we make a bunch of tires, might as well reuse them, right? Yep. That would give me a good idea. Yeah, the only problem, I guess, if you actually did build a range out of all turf with that, it was the fact that you would be only be able to set things down. You wouldn't be able to, like, pound things down necessarily. Yeah. Unless you're just able to pull up the whole turf every time and just cut around. <laughs> but uh, no one's got that kind of money. We've dealt with a lot of turf throughout all of our different gyms. You definitely want to glue it down. Because... Uh, yeah. That's the only time it really gets dangerous is when it turns into, you know, like the, the carpet on a hardwood floor and it like bunches up. That's uh, that's not great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You don't want don't want to don't want to induce injury if possible. That's for yeah. sure. Liability insurance. That's what that's for. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So. So, you know, you come out, you come out of the fence swinging it into shooting. Right. You know, so you came out out of nowhere. You know, I didn't know who you are, um, especially when you first started. You know the the hair is the hair and the the black beard definitely intimidating from a distance. Especially, were you wearing pit vipers when you started, or some like really singular lens shades? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The the mirrored, uh, they're heat wave visual, but uh, yeah, same deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely intimidating from a distance, right? But you know, getting to know you better and uh, chit chatting with you more, make you know you become more personable. You know, from those first couple matches that I remember seeing you at, um, but. Uh, so you know you go to nationals that first year, right? Well, that was twenty twenty three. Yep. You went you went in as B class, and you know you smoke the you smoke the water, and everyone's like, "Who is this guy?" Right? You know, and that's that's the cool thing, I guess, about it is when you come out of nowhere, people don't don't expect it, right? Yeah. Now, if you can remember, um, well, it's you know it's almost been a whole year now because you know Carry Optics is just around the corner. It seems like in June. Yeah, isn't that lovely? Yeah, so you go from being B class at nationals to now you're a grandmaster. Um, I think take take that in, listeners. Right, you know, less than a year in, and he's already a grandmaster. When when he now you you've got a good mental image, you've got good physicality, you know, so you know what it takes to to get to that level because it's not like you're a you weren't a Joe Schmo coming into this. So yeah, I guess let me get back to my question was so when you shot nationals last year, um, what would you have done differently? If you you know if, if Skyler today could tell Skyler fr- from last year's Carry Optics Nationals, what would you tell him? Uh, I'd say set that spray paint can down uh, instead of dropping it. Uh, <laughs> so like second shooter, first stage, first day, it's just pouring down rain. Uh, the lava rocks at Cardinal, uh, steel target paint. You paint between every shooter at Nationals uh, or at all majors. But I uh, went back there, painted a target, dropped that thing from like knee high and exploded that entire paint can all over my legs, all over my gear. Uh, my legs were frosted for the entire Nationals match. Uh, my belt, my like holster and mag pouches and all of that are still uh, flecked with that white spray paint. Uh, I, was in the, I was in the shower doing hot, doing cold, trying to scrub that crap off. And uh, yeah, that was, uh, that, was a, that was a weird look for sure. Uh, everyone's walking around at Nationals trying to keep to themselves, but somebody walks by with, uh, short shorts and bright white legs. You're like, what is it? What is that guy getting up to? Um, but you know, uh, joking aside, um, I'm not sure if I would really change any part of it. Uh, obviously, you know, it worked out well, but, 
uh, it's all a learning experience. Uh, I had a really good squad, met some, you know, Ohio, Pennsylvania homies that, uh, you know, I never would have met otherwise, uh, had a really good time, uh, took some lumps. Uh, obviously, it's a tough match. You know, it's nationals. Like, you're never going to get through 20-plus stages without, you know, some ups and downs uh, unless you're just an absolute robot. Um, so it, it was a good learning experience. Uh, it was uh, meeting great people. It was, I think I, you know, finished kind of exactly where I should have for that match, uh, which is awesome. Uh, a lot of people go to, you know, bigger matches and maybe can't say that. Uh, I've definitely gone to bigger matches and I, you know, couldn't say that. Uh, it was a month prior I shot, you know, the, the Michigan uh, State sectional that, that you and the squad had put on and uh, <laughs> I shot terribly. Uh, it was my first major. It was raining sideways, all that. So all the excuses in the world. I, th- I think you have a valid excuse. You you had great experience about shooting in the rain, though. So That's true. That's you gotta, true. Did you at least, how many stages did you get through at the sectional before it started to downpour? I think it was like four. And then we did the bags dance where we did bags on, bags off, bags on, bags off. And it turned out that every time we put the bags back on was right before I shot somehow. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, somebody was talking to the range master on the radio, like he's about to shoot again. Let's put the bags on. Uh, <laughs> but I get it. It was like sideways rain. Uh, if we didn't have bags on the targets, we had to swap out every one of them. So I, I totally get it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, <clears throat> that definitely uh, sucks. Especially when you're, it's like, Oh yeah, I'm like two up. Come on, come on. Give me, give me no bags. And then it's yeah. like, Oh no bags. It's like, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, you know, play it as it lies for sure. Uh, but yeah, I mean, nationals, uh, I wouldn't, change any part of that um i'm excited to, to go back and get after it this year um i don't know if i'm you know winner gm class but uh i'm gonna compete to the the best of my ability uh and i'm gonna learn from it again mm-hmm. well i mean you're very lucky you're very fortunate you get right you get to shoot against you know jake who's a phenomenal guy to shoot within our our local area you know he's not that far from you yeah. he only lives in saranac so it's not like not like too far from grand rapids i'm surprised you guys haven't had a a one-on-one training session yet, or at yeah. least that you publicized. <laughs> yeah, that we we haven't yet, uh, and this is I'll clip this out and send it to Jake uh, as soon as it's posted because we've talked about it quite a bit. <laughs> but uh, our schedules are kind of crossy, uh, 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 jobs and family and stuff like that. No one needs family. Gosh, Jake, no one needs family. No, I'm just kidding. Family's no, but important. But uh, he's a he's a great dude. He's uh, you know whether he he would say so or not. He's you know been one of my mentors in this. Um, uh, just mostly uh, whipping me uh, through my first year of shooting, but learning from his game. And then he's been so kind as to say, hey, you know, uh, do you want any pointers? Do you want to know how to beat me? All of that. And we've had you know great conversations, and I've tried to put his feedback into practice and. Um, uh, I look forward to a lot of really good matches. Uh, like I said, that Brooklyn match was literally one match point across, I think it was like 700 match points the whole match. So, uh, it's awesome. You know, it's a, uh, iron sharpens iron kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. 100%. I mean, that was a fantastic match for, especially for a first match getting back into, you know, outdoor shooting. I mean, we shot at South Kent a couple weeks prior and I was like, Never again shooting in March outside in this cold. It wasn't even that it was cold. It was the wind that was horrible. Yeah. And I got popper screwed. You know, it's hard to say that a, a guy shooting major got popper screwed. But I, I, I hit the cal. I nicked the calibration zone, and this popper was set so heavy. I'm just like, whatever. I'm gonna lose calibration because good old Kluge. You know, Kluge's gonna take forever and shoot it in the center, and it's gonna go down. And it's gonna be a waste of my time. He's he's gonna shoot it with a 16 inch PCC with uh, factory loads too. Yeah. Uh, which, hey, uh, but yeah, it's when they have to set the poppers heavy because they're blowing over. Yeah, it's it's tough. You gotta drill those things. Yeah, and I yeah, which, and, and you know, end of the world not, but it's it's still that was a cold match. I need to go get myself one of those hand like if, if anyone hasn't seen Skyler on the range, he usually carries this hand warmer holder thing. Yeah. That. Definitely makes a difference on keeping your hands warm. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. I practice outside year round, uh, so it's uh, <laughs> I got all the, the tips and tricks and stuff for staying warm. It's not it's not North Dakota out here, but uh, it isn't warm either. Yeah, no doubt, one hundred percent. It is. It will always and can be worse. Mm-hmm. But hey, it's uh, it's a live and learn, right? So I think the I think the April match last week 
might have been colder, but it wasn't nearly as windy. Uh, well, and it was sunny out too, right? Now that's yeah. that makes the biggest difference. Like training today, it was a beautiful day out there on the range, even if it was a little windy. Like I had one target blow over once, and I was like, "But the sun's out, and I could care less." Yeah. <clears throat> but it's also shooting later in the day. Definitely makes a difference too. Yeah. When you got to start shooting at ten o'clock, it's, it's still cold. Walking stages at eight thirty, uh, wearing a full you know winter coat. That's that's Michigan. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, no doubt about that. So I, I was look, I I was curious. So I pulled up the Michigan sections, you know, people who are shooting the Michigan section all this year. So anyone curious in carry optics, you guys could get a classifier score from this match because hey. there are three GMs so far signed up. Come on out. So that will definitely be a good a good match. Unfortunately, I have to shoot Friday, so my scores have to hold up throughout the whole weekend. So is uh. uh John shooting that? Who's the no, third GM? Uh, Sam. Sam, uh, Sam came up. So there could be four if John comes out or um, John Martello uh, from Chicago if he comes over. Yeah. Yeah, that guy can rip too. Yeah. He's a good dude. I like him. He, uh, I always make fun of him because he and I both enjoy green very much. But yeah. he, he always ends up having more green on him than I do. The lime green, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I like going over to uh, Chesterton, North Porter over there, getting to shoot with the Chicago guys. Yes, North Porter. Oh, that is such a, a good match. Or even the fact that it's a two-day match. So if you can't make one of the days, you can always go shoot the other day. Yeah. It's definitely it's definitely nice because you can – well, for you, it's, it's, it's closer for you probably than it is for me. It's still about two hours before yeah. time change. Yeah, it's two hours, but yeah, like you mentioned, the time change, it's easy to get there. It's just a tough pill to swallow on the way back, and <laughs> you're yeah. looking at a three-hour commute in the face. Yeah, but at least it's not, ter- you know, you, well, you at least stop at Kalamazoo and go north on 131, so yeah, it's not the end of the world. But uh, no, um, no, we have a decent amount of good clubs to shoot at right now. That's the nice thing. There's mm-hmm. not a lot of shooters in the state, but there's definitely a lot of good places to shoot. Yeah, and I mean the shooters on the state, the shooters in the state are on the rise. I don't know about you know total numbers. It's cool to see the new shooters come out, but uh, you know the guys who are competing and getting after it, it's it's awesome. There's a bunch of uh, AM you know GM class dudes that are getting after it, and everyone's on their way up, which you know I love to see. Uh, I hope they I hope they stick it out. I hope we all stick it out. Uh, I know that there's generally that natural progression where you know people progress, and then it's what like three years or something, and people fall out of the sport. Uh, it would be really awesome to to build the scene um, and have a bunch of people that are competitive uh, where you can go out to you know, one of these locals and get a great match and compete against great competition uh, every week. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, that is definitely the nice thing is to go out and compete, get good, good people to shoot against. Yeah, and as you mentioned, it is about every three to five years that the, the sport flips, right? New people come in, old people leave. You know, it's always definitely a... Uh, it's sad to see people go, but it's nice to see the fresh blood come in and stick it out. I was, uh, I've been trying to get people to come shoot this match. I mean, you know, they've already got just as many shooters. They still got plenty of time, but they've got just as many shooters signed up for the Michigan section as that already shot it last year. So that's good. So I'm, I'm wanting this match to be up back under 250. You know, about right about 250 by the end of the match because. The more people you can build into the hype and bring more people into the match, the better you get people at your locals, right? You know, it's always that competing thing. It's like you want to beat your buddy, but you want to beat your buddy who's from Chicago who's coming up. That's that's the true the true bragging rights is kicking your buddy's butt, right? Yeah. And then they gotta think about it on the whole drive home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. I got my little trophy that says I'm better than you, but uh <laughs> The uh I think the date for the sectional probably helps. I know you guys were between a rock and a hard place last year, but not yeah. having it at the beginning of April is probably a benefit. <laughs> I mean, this is true. I it did not help us last year. But I can't oh, that's why. So we had to move area five. That was the problem. Area five had to move because of area one was the same weekend. Um, and then Faster Horses made us move again. Well, it was Faster Horses made us move, and our backup date would have been when Area 1 was. So we moved Area 5 to the sectionals date. That means we moved the sectional to the middle of frickin' April, which which was great for the people who shot on Saturday because it was bright, sunny, and warm until you get the people on Sunday who shot and shot in miserable, crappy rain. Yep. And I, can't, I still couldn't believe how many people were late to that match. Yeah. 
that was there were like two dudes on my squad. Well, I think it's because uh, uh, the range usually starts at ten, and you guys got the the special consideration to start it, you know, earlier. So people are like, oh yeah, I'll roll in at nine forty five. Yeah, that definitely that definitely does not work very well. But hey, we made it through it. We got people into the match. They were able to shoot their stages, but it was definitely like it was in the matchbook, guys. Like, come on. <laughs> but yeah. hey, you know, you people don't read and they don't watch the internet, so. They don't yeah. pay attention when they need, when you need them to pay attention. They don't pay attention. But it is what it is, I guess. So, so Skyler, you know, you're. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about that ma- this April Brooklyn Sportsman's Club match because it was a pretty good match. Other than the 45 minute long backup, that yeah. that that was rough. And I was trying to talk. To, I tried talking to Ricky about it. I don't know um, if we could have done anything better other than putting that in its own bay. Yeah, two class fires, one bay. With like three strings on one classifier, it's gonna take a minute. And that was that would have so if we had put both the new twenty twenty threes in there, it would have been fine because it's one make ready a piece, so two make readies in the bay. Yeah. But when you're doing four make readies essentially, it it doesn't help. And but I think the match was good. Other, I think you and I both agree, Texas stars do not belong in matches. <laughs> yeah, I figured this would come up. Yeah. Uh... I, I fully agree. Uh, I think they're very uninteresting. Uh, but I think like the biggest part is there's just kind of this, this, this kind of hump as far as difficulty goes where until you can split on that steel at like, you know, thirties, right. Texas stars are dang near impossible because it's going to be bucking all over the place and you got to track it and you can't shoot fast enough to clear it before it moves a lot. And then as soon as you can split on that steel at like thirties, you can shoot it stationary. Right. It's not really a challenge at all. I'd rather have five poppers spread out. I'd rather have three poppers spread out. Mm -hmm. So it's not only just like, hey, it's not hard enough. I'm not, you know, trying to be that guy. It's uh, that there's always a huge pop from the squad. Like when you just rail on a star, the squad goes nuts. Um, But I think that they're pretty unfair for me uh, because until you can do it, it's it's it doesn't scale with skill like everything else in the sport does, it's kind of a dichotomy. Can you split 30s on those plates or can you not? And you're going to have a hard time if you can't. <laughs> right. Well, even if you think about it, if it's not spelled out how to reset the star where the one spot's always at the top or the bottom, yeah. or um, does it spin at all? Like there's some old crappy ones that you see out there at matches that just, they don't spin. Like you start shooting them. It, you know, for those guys who can still who are, who might not be able to shoot a thirty split on the steel, they, they're at, you know point fives, but the thing doesn't move, so they can clear it, and it's like this is this is sucks. It's like yeah. the, the test that it's wanting to test, they, it doesn't test. So so let's fix it, right? Uh, two two ideas. Number one, uh, obscure it, right? Where like you can only see half of the star, and so it ha- it moves for everyone, so everyone's got you know roughly the same shooting challenge there. Mm -hmm. Uh, or number two, you extend it a little bit further out where everyone has to shoot, you know, 50 splits on it and it's going to move some, but you know, then you got some of the, some of the newer shooters uh, shooting a Texas star at 15 yards. It's, it's going to get a little spicy. So it, I don't know if there's a great way to fix it. Uh, for me, uh, just like the caption I had on Instagram, leave them bad boys in the barn. Uh, just take, just take five of the regular plates and just like scatter them around the bay. I'm cool with that, right? Right. <laughs> Easier to reset and it's a lot more challenging. Right. Well, it and it always sucks is there's always one guy stuck resetting the darn thing because nobody wants to touch it. I'm, I'm definitely yeah. one of those people's like, I don't want to touch it. I'll hold the plates and you can reset it. I don't want to. And uh, the squad before us, uh, <laughs> you know what they did. You know what the squad before us did. They painted this deal right before they left. And I'm like, hey. Don't paint that. And they go, do you want to paint it? Like, no. And then they still painted it. <laughs> and I'm like, all right. So we have to reset this and it takes forever. And I get sticky fingers. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I don't, I hate reset. I, mm. Another reason why you don't like stars, especially in a major match where you have to paint them between shooters. The, yeah. the squad just is like, really? I have to pick this up, this nasty, wet, painted piece of steel? Yeah. I mean, least- look. Really good match, really good setup. Even that stage was good. Like they used the star well. It's just, I, mm-hmm. I, I think there's better options. Uh, yeah. All right. So you say that stage was. I'm gonna say it was an. Int- I don't know. How do I say this? Nice. I, I told Ricky that I wish that stage would have been different. So I can say this on the air. Yeah. I just felt like there was too many available shots from the front. 
Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. That like now there was always the of how are you going to interact with that one hardcover target on the ground? I mean, that was the one behind the left barrel. Yeah. As you're coming in from the the right side, mm-hmm. or was it? Do you take that one? Do you poke? You know, and then our, my squad ended up. It's like, all right, we're going to shoot this one, and then we're going to shoot that open paper. You know, that's staring you square in the face. You're going to shoot that. Then we reloaded. Mm-hmm. But you guys shot it a little bit different. Well, even on your squad, I saw Jake's video and your video. You guys shot it differently, similarly but differently. Yeah, well, he was he was practicing for uh, IPSC nationals, so he uh, had 15 rounds to work with. So. Uh, if you notice in a video, I, I stacked in as many reloads as he did, just so he didn't have any excuses. But <laughs> he had to he had to plan it that way because uh, he only had 15 rounds. Yeah. Now, yeah. If, now, if there was a way to obscure the star from somewhere, but um, it could have been a bit better. But uh, it was not a bad stage. It could have been better. I'll say that. I'm I'm nice. Now, the next stage over there that uh, I'm kind of curious. What did your squad like? Have a hard time on Bay Four? Yeah, I think it was just the timing on the activators at the end there, just trying to be uh, too quick with it and whatnot. You're talking about the stage that, that you won. Uh, yep, yep. I'm going to talk it. about my stage win. <laughs> <laughs> love to talk about it, yeah. Uh, uh, obviously, you know, no shoots on the way up and whatnot. You deal with those. Uh, so it's, you know, open, no shoot in the middle, open, you move through it. It flowed really well. Uh, and then it was just kind of uh, trying to trying to hero or zero the back array with the activators and stuff, get a bobber going and then shoot some other stuff and come back to the bobber. And it's one of those where, uh, you know, there's kind of two strategies as far as moving targets go. If I could be so bold as to, to speak about strategy as a new guy, uh, but generally two strategies, right? Either hit it and let it do what it do and hope that it times up or uh, hit it and go right to it where you can kind of control the exposure. Um I think most people would want to kind of control the exposure and plan for how long that needs to take. Uh, and I think we just got a little overly aggressive with activating it and going to find other work. And then you come back and the bobber's gone for another second and a half. And then mm-hmm. you put a couple of shots on it and there's a no shoot on the bobber. You don't know if you threw one high or whatever, you wait for another one. Right. So it, I, I think it was one of those where because the pressure was high, because the squad was getting after it. Um, that was one of those where instead of, you know, uh, uh, shooting at 90%, we're all trying to shoot at 99% and kind of kind of came up to bite us. Right. Well, and I only ask because, you know, um, I was shooting with Arache, and Arache mm-hmm. went over to the, your squad or whatnot and asked about that stage. And it was like, you know, he's like, nobody shot it good. It was like, what, what are you talking about? Like, this one was like, it flows really nice. It worked really well. Because I was surprised at the end of the day to see, he was like, what, I have a stage win on this? This is weird. But yeah. I threw my stage down, and then Arache was a couple of shooters later, and she, he threw a matching run on there. So that was kind of, that was nice to see for sure. But um, Yeah, you guys crushed that one. I saw the, I saw the video. You're nice and smooth, flowing. Yeah. Well, I got very lucky in, I don't know, I... I guess the nice thing about knowing the range and the props a little bit, you can kind of guess on timing too, right? Yeah. Like, you know, if you're going to have a forward falling popper, it's going to at least take a second and it's still got to pull the cable to pull the bobber. But I just kind of, you know, I shot that popper and then just went for the, it was right there, but it was not that you couldn't touch it with your freaking pistol anyway, but uh, you know yeah. how that works. It, w- it wasn't terribly far, but it was a nice stage. Um, yeah. <laughs> I watched, it was kind of funny. There was a stage, a stage very similar to that one I saw on the internet, and I'm watching the RO sprint like bloody murder <laughs> to try to catch up with the shooter when they could have just walked around the outside. I mean, the stage we shot, the RO just kind of followed you along. It was kind of entertaining. I'll have to send you this video of the guy just like hoofing it to keep up with the guy, and I'm just like, but you could have walked around the outside guy. You would have been fine. Yeah, that's definitely a, an aspect of stage design that goes uh, underlooked quite a bit, where it's uh, underappreciated, where... Uh, it, how, where does the RO go? You know, uh, really tight final positions and stuff like that. It's like, where, where's the guy with the timer stand? Right. Or how do you, yeah, how do you, oh, and that, that's another thing too. You know, you just took your RO class back uh, earlier this year, um, you know, and you're learning a little bit about that. And yeah, where do you stand? Where are you not going to screw with the guy? You know, because that's, that's a big thing too, right? You got to, you got to worry about where you're standing to not have them bump into you and be like, oh, you interfered with me. I couldn't go get that target now. Yeah, and then you got the the PCC shooter on the squad, and you got to get way up in the ejection port and all of that kind of stuff, and changes your position. Like it's it's an art uh, being a great RO, uh, and 
like you said, I'm a new guy. I'm, you know, just learning that thing. But I know that uh, some stages uh, don't account for that, and uh, that's tough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it definitely can. Yeah, you. A lot of people don't understand that when it comes to stage design. How is it easier to, you know? Well, and then there's also options too, right? You know, mm-hmm. you might you might have one guy do this wacky plan that ends him up some weird spot, and you're like, well. I didn't catch the last shots because he did something stupid, yeah. you know, because, you know, at a major match, you, you know, the person working the stage kind of knows where everybody's going to go by the end of the first squad, right? Like, there's n- typically no wonky plans at that point. But, yes, there's always going to be the one guy who's like, I'm going to do it completely backwards <laughs> and upside down. Like, it's... Start anywhere outside and he starts all the way at the front. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and retreats the whole stage. Yeah. I think that's why uh, nationals, it was what, 21 carry optics nationals. And it was like 21 stages and like 19 of them were start straddling the stick. You know, it's like Mm -hmm. uh, standardized. Standardized, but thank you for watching another episode of Manny Talk Shooty. I greatly appreciate it. And if you could do me a favor, please go patronize our sponsors here when you are available. We've got Hunter's HD Gold, Go Fast, Don't Suck, Outdoor Dynamics, Make Stuff Better, Range Panda, Southern Barbecue, Laugh and Load, Summit City Bullets, Two Alpha Apparel and Tom Castro Shoot Academy. Now let's get back to this episode. It it still is annoying, right? You could easily have feet on marks. Like this is this is what I'd prefer. At least put feet on marks or whatever. Like because somebody, I think Shooting Sports Innovations makes like those die cut metal X's. Yeah. Stand here. We don't worry about it. Just put your feet where the feet things go. Yeah. You don't have to worry about is he straddling it enough? Is is he is he is he loading too much on one leg? Um, yeah. not to pick on you from when you made that comment, but it is a valid thing, right? It's like, has some old crotchety guy going to really like your start, how you look at the start, right? Yeah. I mean, I felt bad for the ROs, our first stage. They're like, okay, here's what a straddle looks like. I'm like, what are, what are we doing here? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. But yeah, uh, and that sucks. <laughs> So-and-so will demonstrate how to straddle the stick. <laughs> yeah, and they try to not make eye contact with anyone. You know, it's like they look right at the back of the bay while I straddle that. <laughs> it's yes. Yeah, there's there's no good way to do it. But yeah, and, uh, uh, Fort Wayne down there in Harlan has those uh, uh, start start and uh, you know uh, the PCC mark and all that kind of stuff positions, and mm-hmm. it is unambiguous. I'll tell you that much. Uh, there's no guessing. Yep, exactly, and that's that's what you need to have, right? No guessing, just let it be. Uh, frankly, I want to see more ridiculous start positions. I mean, that's one of the things that you could always mess around with. It's, you know, like a super wide start position and you got to like play the air guitar and stuff during a make, like, you know, let's, let's get a little goofy with it. Oh, well, okay. So South Kent in March, right? The really awkward, like wide yeah. foot position. I'm like, God, I'm like really like engaging my groin, like to stand here. Like this is like eh, power stance. Well, and everyone's like. <laughs> Yeah, you're lucky you're not that short. I'm like, I'm still kind of short, guys. But yeah, that was a that was a wickedly wide stance as well. Yeah, they do that a lot with the IPSC stuff. You're always starting like holding stuff, and I'm like, why can't we, you know, like hold like one of those blow up air guitars and get rowdy, you know? There, ooh, that that would be pretty cool. I, I better tell uh, Buckeye Blast guys we're changing start positions. <laughs> yeah. Feet on marks, holding inflatable air guitar. Yeah, a power chord. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, you have to you have to do ten seconds of your favorite Metallica song before you get the "Are you ready?" <laughs> <laughs> yes, every every shooter must uh, listen to, to Enter Sandman before they can start. <laughs> yep, that's my that's my. If I was king of USPSA for a day, uh, it's very simple. It goes walk up songs. That's yep. it. You know, that would be pretty. That would be pretty cool. Walk up mm-hmm. songs. But yeah, got and it, but it's got to be a function where you got like a little key tag on you, mm-hmm. and it will recognize when you pass this marker that the song's going to start playing. Yeah, as Instead soon as of, they, as soon as they call it, somebody's trying to chase down the shooter with a tablet and stuff, and it just like cues, you know, uh, the the four hours of Rodney Coleman screaming YouTube video, and then it's <laughs> it's all right, uh, Skyler's up next, and it's just a bunch of yeah buddies. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> That would be that'd be pretty good too. Mm-hmm. That'd be pretty baller. <clears throat> Not gonna lie. I mean, anything to get more people hype, right? Like, have you had the? You're probably one of those guys too. But uh, have you had a chance to squad with Joey Sauerland yet? Oh yeah, that was uh, I squatted with him at A five, which was which was awesome. Yeah, all the who about yep the hollering and the clapping and the the get some, yeah he is one of the best people to to squad with. I shot with him at uh, Kentucky, and that was fun. 
that was yeah. truly a fun experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. Him but, and his, his cousin, uh, uh, Michael Norman, both great shooters, but dude, uh, the prototype for like being a good shooter and also bringing energy and not being, you know, switched on a thousand percent serious all the time. Cause I've been around those folks too. And it's like, yeah, you're winning, but are you, you know, cause you're not having any fun at all. Right. Or you're just a drag on the squad, right? Like you could, and you don't feel like you can talk to them because I'm in the zone. Don't talk to me. Yeah. I'm doing my weird air. I'm doing my weird air gun in the whole day. I'm like, I get it. Right. Rock your visualizations, do your mental walkthroughs for sure. But, uh, up until, you know, you're like in the hole, uh, let's have fun. You know, that's what we're here for. Yeah. I agree. You know, get your mental walkthroughs, but there's always time to like, hold on, let me finish this. And then be like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, you're talking about whatever and you move on. Yeah. Or, or, or the shooter on your squad who gets so pissed because of one bad thing ruins their whole day. And it's like the end of the world. Yeah. I've uh, shot with a couple of those people and that's, that's not fun. The, uh, the trope that the trope, the shooter trope that uh, gets me the most aggravated is, uh, when I gas people up and, uh, you know, feed them compliments and stuff and they always get the yeah, butts, you know, oh, gosh. Uh, that was killer, right? You smacked that last position. You're putting out like 12 splits. Yeah. But the reload was slow man take the compliment right like mm-hmm. we're all out here having fun getting after it uh somebody goes out of the way to tell you you're doing a great job and i've been guilty of this too right i was guilty of this a lot and then this is you know one of those things steve anderson talks about and he he talked about it, it hit me like a ton of bricks i'm like dang i've done that before uh and when you start to notice it you can't not notice it there's so many people where you try to gas them up get them excited and yeah but this one little part didn't go right i'm like man we're having fun you know Yeah, absolutely, and that's the one thing I do like about Steve is like just take the compliment, you know, be good about it, feel good about what you did. You don't need to worry about the ten things you got wrong. Worry about the good things you got right. Yeah, and you know, uh, all the time they got ten things right and they got one little thing wrong, and that's all they upset. And it's like, dude, I've been there, right? If somebody throws you a life jacket and says, "Hey, you did really well in this," right? Quit thinking about the stuff that doesn't matter. Take it. Right. Swim to shore. Uh, have fun with the squad, you know? Right. Oh, hundred percent. Having fun. You know, th- that's why we're here. Really, I mean, yes, we're there to compete and perform well, but really we're there to have fun. That's why we do this. Right. And if you can't have, uh, any fun, it, it, it's not worth doing. Right. Yeah. It's absolutely not worth it. You know, you could stay at home and sit in the corner and, and be mopey or playing video games, but with against 14 year olds and cry. <laughs> And I totally get it. People have lots of time and energy and, you know, uh, resources invested in this and they want to do well for sure. But you do better when you're angry. You do better when you're having fun. You know, mm-hmm. it, I get it. You know, you want to win matches, but the best, the, the best people I've been around, uh, the people that I want to squad with again are the people who smash matches and also have fun. Mm-hmm. Right. And I will say Steve does has a point when people just stop caring, right? They've already had the dumpster fire and mm-hmm. then they're just there to not care and have fun. That's when they do their best shooting. And then they're like, oh, look at, you know, I still shot 95% of the match winner, even though I had one dumpster. And, and that's, that's a good thing too. Yeah. To be able to recover from that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. 100% on that. So um, what are we looking for on the horizon for 2024? Yeah. Um, Trying to compete, uh, traveling, seeing some of the, the homies from last year. Last year was, you know, my first year shooting majors and whatnot, so I didn't know a lot of people. And, you know, it's obviously fun to travel and get after it. But this year, now I, you know, know some of those people that will be seeing at these matches, uh, Airbnb shenanigans, and uh, catching up with folks. So, you know, obviously the social aspect of it. Um, you know, I put a lot into this and, you know, time and practice and whatnot, so I really want to do well. But... Uh, like I was saying, mostly I, I, I want to see the people. I want to travel, get after it, and, uh, you know, take this show on the road. Uh, being that, you know, we have the six months off from <laughs> October till now, uh, feeling cooped up, want to get after it, uh, and want to do well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, absolutely. You want you want to do well and burn it down right now. Um, yeah. We've got what? Um Buckeye Blast. I mean, this by the time this comes out, guys, Buckeye Blast will be over. Unfortunately, just how it kind of rolls on the scheduling of things. But uh, we got Buckeye Blast. Uh, what's after that for you? Uh, Buckeye Blast uh, Area Eight, I think, comes after that, right before uh, Care Optics Nationals, and then I, think, I don't remember if it's Area Five or Michigan Sectional after that. Uh, next up, 
but uh, those are the majors that I have planned. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if other ones will pop up, you know, those kind of later in the season, August, September majors, uh, but uh, those are the big ones. Area 5, Area 8, Ohio, Michigan, and Carry Optics Nationals. There you go. Oh, area eight is going to be a killer, though. Have you seen the videos of like just yesterday of the yeah. swinging, the moving targets and every? Oh, I was like, yeah, that was. Uh, those are some of the guys that I got to meet at Buckeye last year. Is all the Pennsylvania hooligans, uh, Dan and Patches, and all of them boys getting after it. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, they've been sending me. Uh, it, it looks like freaking Autobots out there, uh, and I'm, I'm uh, sorry, Decepticons. It looks like Decepticons out there, and I'm excited to go to battle against them. Mm -hmm. So speaking of Autobots and Decepticons, did you see the new trailer for Transformer 1? Man, uh, is it like a remake of the first one? I'm no, so out of the loop. So Transformer 1 is before Optimus Prime gets the Matrix of Leadership. So he is still like who like he was created as, like um, Orion Pax. And Megatron doesn't even have a name. So you get to kind of see the the upcoming to all of the crap so back in the day dude i think yeah. you know if we keep rolling that timeline back eventually we're going to get to beast wars and that's the one that i'm fired up for if we get to the beast wars where they turn into cheetahs and stuff mm -hmm. fire me up yeah that was a good cartoon people don't understand that that was a good cartoon <laughs> we're we're showing our age though <laughs> i mean yeah i i don't know if i got to watch that when it came out or why i watched that on a reruns but i don't know i i don't I turned 30 this year, guys. Like, you know, so by the time you all listen to this, it's, you know, March. No, it's April, end of April 2024. In September, I'm turning 30. So all the good cartoons were not wasted on me. Yeah. Aging like, aging like fine wine. You look better than ever before, Manny. Yeah. This is why I wear a hat, though, so no one can <laughs> see the receding hair. I don't have luscious hair, right? Like, I will say it goes, my family, it goes thin, but I don't get that bald spot back here. So if it goes, like, hey. uh, living in, living in with a, hair problems right that's just how it is but you, uh you just got to get some neck tattoos and like a waist length beard you'd be good uh, yeah my dad tried that once and that was he he looked <laughs> like remember when duck dynasty was really big yeah my dad had a duck dynasty beard and i'm like dad you gotta get rid of this thing because it, it was all white he what didn't have any color it was just all white i was like looking like gandalf out here yeah, he only wishes he was Gandalf. He might think he is. But uh no, so if you if you haven't gotten anything in September time frame, you need to shoot the Indiana section. Yeah, I've heard that a couple of times. Yeah, down there in uh down there in Terre Haute. Yep. Uh, I, that one's looking to go on to my schedule. I just gotta get the guys figured out if we're carpooling and room splitting before yep. I pull the trigger on that one. Because that should be a good match. Last year was good when it was a single day format, but it'll be a whole weekend. Well, it'll still be a single day format, but they'll be shooting all three days instead of just the one day. So I think that would be a good match to go to. Get some options. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of a hike down from Michigan uh, since it's all the way in the south part of Indiana, southern part of Indiana. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'll definitely look at it. Um, there's a bunch of those uh, kind of later season matches that uh, I'm trying to see how the, how the motivation, how the, how the juice is at the end of the season there after June, July, and see how I'm feeling. Do I want to, you know, just talk into practice? Uh, go to classes or some classes up here at that point, or do I want to keep the, the show on the road going to major set? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, especially with carry optics nationals being so early in the season, like I wish I, I said, I told, I told people I was going to open nationals, but with the cost of things and just everything in general, I was like, ah, I can't make it this year, unfortunately. And well, really, I blame my sister. She's getting married. So uh, got to go on the, all the wedding things. And it's just like, she didn't want to get hitched in Talladega, Alabama. Well, no, she's getting married. She's getting married, Michigan sectional weekend. So, oh. <laughs> so I can't. I, I'm ending up just shooting that match on Friday and not even have to staff it, which is which is nice on that part. But it's also like it's like, dang it. But hey, it doesn't matter. I get to shoot with my buddy John Royer from Outdoor Dynamics, who's coming up from North Carolina. So hey, there you go. Yeah, he came up and shot one of their club matches, I think, in June last year, and he really enjoyed it. So his uh, in laws live. Uh, East, no, west of you. They live over there by the lake, but by, by Grand Rapids, though. So, but uh, so it was. That, that'll be a good time for sure. So, um, dude, oh, I guess I, I do have to get to these listener questions. So, this is the part where all the hilarious questions come out. Um, I was I was warned. <laughs> yes. Well, I don't know how crazy they think they are, but we'll we'll see. Gotcha. Okay. It was weird. Like I had a buddy message me while we were doing while we're doing this, and it's like. 
what are you like listening to the conversation somehow? And I know that they don't live with you because they have their own family, but it's like is someone hacking into my computer. <laughs> so, but but uh, it made sense after I got clarification via the text message. All right. So we've got some good questions. Um, first is Billy Harrington wants to know what conditioner do you use? Oh man, I'll tell you what, Billy Boy down there, uh, Missouri, getting after it. I met him at the uh, Steve Anderson uh, Joyce Ireland class in Ohio. Uh, him and his son Braden uh, down there shredding. Uh, Billy, I'm sure you heard about it down there. Uh, it, mane and tail. Uh, it's for horses, but uh, if you want to have a, if you want to have a fantastic mane, you got to rock the mane and tail. It comes in jugs uh, about as big as your torso. Uh, you just dip your hand in there and run it through. Um, uh, I look forward to seeing you grow your hair out this next year, Billy. Yeah, you know, well, you know, you you don't look fast unless your hair is flowing in the wind. I mean, it's, it's a it's a proven fact. That's what I'm saying. I haven't got around to braiding it yet, but it, it does. Uh, at the very least, it makes the Instagram videos look faster. Uh, as long as you don't look at the bottom where the hits are, uh, mm-hmm. no problem. Right, and and that, that is something you do with your videos. You do the split thing like John Martello does. You know, you have yeah. both the videos, and then you've got the the practice score. Um, are you doing that? Out, you're doing that out manually, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, I do that in uh, in DaVinci, so I pull everything out and then edit all of it and all of that. I do get questions about that a lot, uh, and people are always really disappointed because they think it's they think there's some app out there that'll do it. Uh, I haven't found it yet. Uh, <laughs> I cut them all manually. Yeah, well, our, well, feel lucky. Your computer can run DaVinci Resolve. Um, mine, not so much. You got a you got an Apple computer or what? No, my desktop is just doesn't have enough. You need like a bajillion amounts of RAM to run it. It's uh, it's it's hor- It's not a gaming computer. It's, but it's definitely like, why? Yeah, that's uh, we're all we're all nerds in a sport one way or the other. That's why I'm sitting on my couch. This is I'm a I'm a couch surfer. So my you know like TV runs through a computer. It's my gaming PC. So uh, it eats up DaVinci Resolve, but uh, it also eats up my old man. You know. Uh, uh, RPG games. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. What? Well, okay. Now I got to know what RPG games. Yeah. So uh, I've been a big Diablo two guy for my whole life. Uh, oh, you, you and Logan Saunders, man. You and yeah. Logan loves that game. So there's they actually remade it uh, or like update it. It's not a full remake. It's called Project Diablo two, uh, and they continue to support it. The game is literally it came out in two sorry nineteen. 19- 92, I think. It just had its 20, 20 year anniversary. No, it would have been uh, 2002. Had its 20 year anniversary in 2022. And they're still like updating it. And so, anyway, that one, I uh, like your classic Skyrims and stuff. I like old man style RPGs. I used to be another first person shooter, getting in there with the 14 year old kids like you talked about. But <laughs> they got a lot more time to practice than I do. Uh, and <laughs> uh, every time I do that now, I get whipped on. So, uh, it's, I'm staying in a single player experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I remember I, I used to get down with some Skyrim and some oblivion mm-hmm. back in the day. Uh, but when I started my quote unquote real job, uh, I just, I lost interest in playing video games. It was just like, so, well, it didn't help, you know, being married, you got to find time to, for each other. So it's like, yeah, you can't be playing video games all day. So, yeah. Hey, look, dude, you can stream it. You could have a whole second career. I heard it pays super well. Yeah, I'll just put it behind this kind of money where I'm getting all this big boo goo buck for running a podcast, right? <laughs> you um, already you already got the headset, man. Get on some Fortnite and get after it. Yeah. No. <laughs> I'm not I might have good reflexes when shooting real guns, but when it comes to video game shooters, I'm just like I'm terrible. Like no one wanted me when when back in the day, nobody wanted me on their Halo party or their uh Call of Duty team. It was just like, yeah, don't don't put Manny on there. Uh, I was the guy who they said get drive the car, just drive the damn car. Yeah, that's whipping a, whipping the warthog. Yeah, that's hey, that's a crucial part of the team. Yeah, just don't. And then then if you get blown, you know, you get flung across with like an explosion. They're like, you suck at driving. How can I control the explosion, you asshole? Yeah, that's when you you squat up and just drive off the map on the next one. Yeah, that or you just <laughs> jump out and say screw you as yeah. it's falling over the cliff. Uh. Oh, this is another one from Billy. In the word "sent," which is silent, the S or the C? Ooh, that's tough. Um, I I gotta think uh, the S. To be honest with you. Fair enough. Now, yeah. is there is there a story behind this question, or I, or, I don't or? think so. Unless he's just been listening to a lot of Lil Wayne. I don't I don't really know where that's coming from. It's uh, uh, silent. G's moving silence like lasagna. Uh, I think it might be a reference. I 
I don't I don't know where he's come from with that one. That must be a, a southern thing. Fair enough. And he's also a grandmaster in carry optics, isn't he? Yeah, he's the grandmaster. I'll tell you that much. That boy shreds. Mm-hmm. I watched uh, one of his videos the other day. It was it was pretty spicy. Yeah. So our buddy Ryan wants to know what is the shortest inseam shorts you can wear before you enter the danger zone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, it's the perennial struggle. It's a it's a lifelong uh, a lifelong journey for me trying to find uh, uh, short and shorter shorts that still have belt loops. So if anyone has a, a connect on uh, short shorts that go you know six inch inseam or shorter that still have belt loops, let me know. Um, mm-hmm. but it turns out Ranger panties do not have belt loops, um, nor, you know, do they have like webbing or anything like that. So I think that would be like the danger zone. Uh, as long as you're staying on your feet, it's probably, it's probably fine. But if we're doing like the bed starts that they were doing at IPSC nationals, uh, you might, you might have to point that bad boy down range. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if that's going to go so hot. So yeah, that, uh, or you'd be like that weird guy who, uh, not the weird people that they're wearing them, but wear kilts at a match. Yeah. Just, just don't fall down. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's uh chair start or whatever you guys start with your legs crossed. That's, that's not ideal. Yeah. And then, uh, I don't know. I don't know who this guy, but his first name looks like to be Bruce. If USPSA let you pick, pick, let the shooter pick a song to walk out to, what song would he be, you be picking? Yeah, that's Bruce, uh, a local guy here in Grand Rapids. He's a hoot. He's the one that comments all the the Ronnie Coleman uh, comments on my YouTube videos. Uh, <laughs> walkout song, it would probably change stage by stage. Uh, that's one of those for my my Instagram handle, DJ Dave Doubles. Uh, I've been the the guy that plays music in the weight room for my whole life. Uh, moved to a small town in Ohio in like fifth grade, and everyone knew each other and stuff. So that's how I got in with uh, like the team and whatnot was. We were listening to the same uh, freaking ACDC CD on repeat uh, all the time in all of our lifts. I'm like, I'm going to burn some CDs. So elbow deep in uh, uh, lime wire and all of that kind of stuff, uh, filling my parents' computer with viruses. Or, <laughs> not, as long as it's not yours, right? <laughs> I mean, I mean, paying for all the music. I paid for all of it. What's the, the statute of limitations? But um <laughs> Uh, so I was, you know, the the mix master in the in the weight room for for better or for worse. Um, but uh, I have a very diverse taste in music. So you know, it might be a uh, like a dreams and nightmares. Meek Mill would be a really good one walking out to. It might be like some bluegrass stuff. Uh, uh, big Benjamin Todd guy can be like an O Day or something like that. Uh, it might be as referenced earlier, four hours of Ronnie Coleman screaming. Uh, if you could put that link in the show notes, that would be awesome. Uh, let the let the <laughs> let the people get after that one. But um, if you send it to me, I'll put it in the show notes. So. There you go. Yeah, it's, I bet they're making all kinds of all kinds of YouTube ad revenue on that one. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, yeah, it would change uh, if I had to pick one. Uh, it'd probably be some Gojira stuff. Uh, like I said, we're all we're all nerds in this sport, so that's one of those kind of like. You know, prog rock, like super technical metal bands. So it'd probably be a, a Gojira. Uh, I want to say like the Flying Whales Gojira, right? When it starts to break down after the whale noises stop and the guitar starts, that's where I'd be. Ooh, that, that'd be pretty good. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to have to go look that one up. But it sounds exactly what the right so- part of the song you want, right? It's it's like a minute and a half of whale noises and then <laughs> they start screaming and cranking on guitars. So I'd probably go like, 15 20 seconds of whale noises just to kind of throw everyone off right and then right at the make ready we got the the guitar right Ooh, let me see do i know do i have a good song maybe well oceans have ocean avenue would always be one of the a good song to jam out to right they're they're the one that, i'm sad that they're not touring and they broke up but that would be one of that's one of the only bands i would go see live um in that and bowling for soup right so Ooh. Which, funny enough, I'm back up in your neck of the woods. Um, August first, I got a bowling for soup concert up there um, that weekend. That oh, yeah. Thursday. Where's so, that at? Uh, the Interceptor. Yeah, the Intersection. Yeah. Yeah. That's Intersection. A, that's a great venue. It's just a big old warehouse. You can get after. You can get in there and throw your elbows in the pit. Yep. Now, ooh, what song would it be? Probably Ohio. Come back to Texas is probably one of my favorite ones because it makes fun of Ohio. You know, because <laughs> everyone's got to bust up on Ohio. Yeah. Even That's... the guys from Texas now, but the, the lead singer for Bowling for Soup, he actually started like a country band, which I wouldn't say he's a country band because he just sounds like the guy from Bowling for Soup. Yeah, you know his it, it doesn't his music always sounds good though too, so I can't I can't complain. So yeah, no, I'd find I'd probably you know what probably the Phineas and Ferb theme song because they they played that and that's always a hoot. So that's that's worth a hit factor at least. 
at least or everyone would be like yeah. what did this guy pick this song for i'm like yeah. I don't know. I, I either always you're, to that. <laughs> you're up a hit factor or everyone else is down one, right? Yeah. It's 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 hey, a two-hit factor swing. <laughs> that's all that matters. The math is all that matters, right? Exactly. Yeah. Mm. But, uh, oh, Lord, let's see. Do I have any other questions? I think we, uh, maybe, as everyone listens to me ramble on. You know what they, they say about podcasting is that you just can't have any dead air. So you could talk about absolutely nothing for 45 minutes as long as there's no silence in there. It's a talk show, yeah. Exactly. Now, if somebody wants to actually hire me for morning talk show radio, be my guest. I can sit here and talk and ramble and be a DJ too, but hey. <laughs> but, uh, oh, there we go. So, Skyler, I, I kind of try to ask this question. This, this kind of stemmed from my buddy Jay Beal um, asking it a bunch of million times. Um, what is your make ready like? Oh, yeah. Uh, pretty simple. Uh, load the gun, take a side picture. Sorry, take a side picture. Load the gun, check it. Uh, if it's a Barney, load another one. Um, and then I like a, uh, a step back off of the spot just so the RO knows that I'm not like actually ready. So I'll holster it and all of that. Uh, step back off the spot, go with a big loud clap uh, just because I like to get my hands going some, especially when it's cold. And then I go through one more visualization on everything that we're going to do. Step into whatever the start position is, take a big old breath uh, all the way in, all the way out. And then I try to pick if I'm going to a position, I try to pick a really tiny spot and try to pick out one, you know, grain of sand, one uh, blade of grass down there. Or if I'm, you know, target staring me in the face, I'm trying to pick one little spot on that target. So it's kind of the, uh, the ritual with the, getting the machine set and then getting your mind set and then getting the visual system set um, is kind of like the three steps that I try to go through. Uh, and now that I am actually a GM, uh, that can take up to eight or nine minutes uh, as, as GMs. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's only like 20, 30 seconds. But I will tell you that every time I watch it on video after the match, I'm like, am I taking too long? Uh, no, it's because people don't know how to start recording video at the proper time. Like, yeah. one, I love, I love all you guys who help record video. But can you, like, at least, like, be respectful and be like, do it right before he's about to say, are you ready? Yeah. Because – I hate editing that too. Like, or or at least like get some shenanigans on film. You know, it's like turn to the rest of the squad, have somebody cut a promo, or like zoom in on their butt while they're doing the make ready or so. Like, like make least, it fun. You know, yeah. At least entertaining enough to hopefully I get a blooper clip off of it, right? Yeah, yeah. But that minute and a half, and I'm standing there uh, before they even call make ready, like that that hurts. I get real self conscious. I'm like, is this taken to you know? But uh, yeah, that's uh, that's the process. Uh, it's working okay. Um, uh, uh, subject to change, I might throw you know a Ronnie Coleman yell in there or something. So don't hold me to it. Uh, if you hear a lightweight for the next bay over, uh, just take that energy and you know use it for your run too. All right there, you go. You know, and so you're saying if a GM gets eight minutes, do I get to prorate it on my percentage off of a GM? Is that how that works? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I get to. T- oh, that'd be ho- that's that's too funny though. No, yeah, uh, the open shooter just banging on the bottom of the big stick, trying to get it to seat for like four minutes. Yeah, no, that's definitely not. Uh, I mean, some people, <laughs> yes, that's how it goes. Or, well, it used to be this long push, like click, where you hear that, that yeah. click. Now it just goes, it's in there. Yeah, but, it uh, terrifies me every time. Every time I RO an open shooter, I'm like, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? Uh, did it actually see? Because there's a lot of times that thing comes out of the holster and the magazine just falls, or the very first round just gacks and won't feed. Yep. Well, and that's why you got to do like the, the, the little tuggy. Like, you got to do the little tuggy. Like, People think that, you know, just because you're doing like you've got super tactical, you know, these simple competition guns that are super expensive, you can't do the simple, you know, tap rack, you know, you can't do the, the you know, press check the stupid. I don't know how many open shooters I know who don't actually press check their gun. Yeah. Like I press check mine every time. It's part of my make ready. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, just make sure there's a bullet in there or the mag's going to stay. Yeah. You or do anything, ahead. you do anything else special when you make ready, like turn a high five to the RO or something? No, because usually it's like, oh, thanks, thanks for letting me not RO guys. Like, <laughs> it's usually how it goes. It's like, like if you if you shoot with my buddy Ken Wes and I, we're pretty much we try not to take the timer as much as we can, so new people get experience and other people have to. Yeah. But it's also like we're always getting the thing. It's like, oh, hang on, let me shoot first, and then I'll take it back. It's one of those like I barely get the two shooters before me kind of break. Yeah, part of your make ready is you just hit the delayed shot timer on your necklace and then go, you know? (laughs) Well, that's funny enough, too. So at the uh, 
Brooklyn match, we used my timer, and I was like, I had it synced to my tablet. Like yeah. the tablet, they was like, this is synced. So everyone, don't push times in. Just hit the button so we can get data. Mm-hmm. And there, and of course, the first shooter is up, and it's still on delay. It's on delay for my dry fire. I'm like, oh, crap, hang on. Yeah. Pushed it over and then handed it back to the guys. <laughs> That's tough. Too many settings. Uh, those timers are nice, for sure. I just got a, a, an SG uh, Go, and if anyone hears this and can help me with it, I'd reach out to Shooters Global and everything, but you can't change the random delay. The random delay is only two to four seconds. That's it, right? You can't change. So I'm in dry fire, hitting that thing and just ripping right into position because sometimes it goes off in two seconds, and mm-hmm. that's quick, right? That's that's usually accompanied by a standby, so like you're already set, you know? Yeah. Uh, that, that's a tough one for dry fire. So if you guys know how to change that, or if for some reason Shooters Global is across the pond listening to this, what's up, dudes? Uh, let us change the random delay on that. Yeah, uh, that is definitely quick, right? Like I have mine set to one and a half to four. I think one and a half to four and a half when I delay it. But like I've always got, I've got my one hand by the gun already kind of set. So then my secondary hand kind of goes to the spot. But yeah. I got gotcha. you. If you're definitely not really prepared, it, it's very quick. That would be a it'd be a good running question for the super nerds. What is your what is your dry fire random delay on your shot timer? Yes, uh, exactly. Two and a half to six. That would probably be preferred. That, but that six seconds is going to feel like forever when you're yeah. ready to go. It's like is it going to beep yet? It's going to beep yet? Nope. And then yep. it beep. Or then you realize you hit the other button instead of the go button. <laughs> it's like yeah. Yeah, I've been there. It's uh, but every once in a while you get that, you know, the RO gives you the, you know, are you ready? Stand by, and then they're like, is he actually? Is he? At, okay, hit it, you know, and you get the the long beep. I can deal with a quick beep, uh, but the long beep is tough. You're falling out of position. They write you up for creeping. You know, it's like I didn't think I was that creepy. They're like creeping minus ten. You know. Have you actually gotten a creeping penalty? No, but okay. that's. Uh, I try to give those, I, I try to threaten the boys on the squad with those every time, especially when they're, they're back there with their, their off color comments and stuff. Like you're going to get a creeping, uh, but, uh, not, not for actually leaving before the start beat, but for being creepy, no. yeah, you, get a, you get a creeping before you even have to make ready. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. Well, brother, um, this is the part of the show where I like to, uh, you know, pay back to people. Um, do you have anybody who you want to shout out or companies that you may or may not start working with? Uh, not currently. Uh, that's one of those things where, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to have fun. I'm trying to get after it. I'm trying to, you know, uh, obviously be a, be a leader and, uh, try to, uh, uh, work to improve the local scene. So mm-hmm. if somebody, you know, wants to get on board with that, they absolutely can. That's, you know, kind of my pitch, but, um, I'm not out here trying to chase down sponsors and, you know, fill a jersey with, you know, 40 logos and stuff like that. If people do that, that's totally fine. Uh, I get it. You know, people have uh, different priorities in the sport. But for me, I want to go out there and have a great time. Uh, And, you know, if somebody, you know, can can lend a hand in that, if somebody can help to enhance that, if somebody can help me to help other shooters, that would be awesome. But uh, I'm not the I'm not the, you know, 80 discount codes kind of guy. At least not yet. Maybe in you know a year I'll eat my words, and that'll be awesome. I'll come back to listen to this and listen to how stupid I sounded. <laughs> right, but uh, so <clears throat> if people want to, people want to get a hold of you, Skyler, what's the best way to do it? Now, now say they want to be a client of yours too. Where's where's a good place for them to get a hold of you and <laughs> go get some coaching? Yeah. So uh, if you want to get a hold of me, just uh, Instagram is the easiest way to do that. Uh, DJ Dave Doubles, uh, all one word on Instagram. Uh, you got to type it all the way out because you, me, everyone else knows that yeah, shadow band, you can't just come up with a, you know, the search history. So DJ Dave doubles, uh, shenanigans on there. Um, and then, you know, if you want to, if you want to get training for in the Grand Rapids area, it's uh, power strength training systems. That's this PS, not Penn station. Although I do love Penn station. Uh, those fries are elite, but this is for power strength training systems. Uh, uh, let me know. Uh, you can let me know via Instagram. That's fine. I'll put you in. Uh, I'll put you in the pipeline. I'll put you in contact with the right people. But um, no, I love it. If uh, if you are a mutual, if you'd like to put holes in targets and then uh, paste those holes in targets and have a good time doing it, like dude, reach out uh, because it's a great community, great energy. I want to get to meet people. 
Uh, and I want to, you know, obviously, you know, travel to these matches and see friends there and get after it and bring the good vibes. One hundred percent. Yeah. Same with it. Dig it. Love it. You know, support this local scene. Have fun. Have fun. Do good well at it. So, Skylar, brother, thank you for coming on and joining me this af- this evening and uh, getting the good word out about how awesome we are here in Michigan. So, yeah, uh, it's good. Bet, I can't wait to see where you go the rest of the season and onward. So I appreciate your time. And, uh, well, we'll have to do this again at some point. I know we will. Um, you know, when, you know, you, you beat Jake at, uh, the state championship and, uh, we'll call it a good time, right? I'll send him this clip too. Yeah. There you go. Just rub (laughs) it in. Right. But, uh, listeners get out and do the things. I'll see you on the next one.